Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special WorkTech webinar in partnership with Condeco. It's part of a year long program of research and communication called Condeco Conversations. I'm Jeremy Myerson. I'm director of WorkTech Academy and a design professor at the Royal College of Art. And it's my privilege to be chairing our panel today. We've got a great lineup of speakers and I'm going to introduce them all in a moment and a great discussion in store. But first, a little bit of global context. The start of September was meant to be the start of the great office return. We were heading back to the workplace and putting the pandemic behind us. I say meant to be because clearly it's not all going to plan. Evidence from around the work tech network suggests that companies are still trying to figure their pathway out of the pandemic. They're struggling to find a more flexible model and rethinking what their offices are for. They're delaying plans they announced earlier, and they're revising what tech, what space, and what policies they're going to need in the future. This webinar dives right into that churning maelstrom of change. The central question of Condeco Conversations is what are the routes for revival? It's a simple question, but it's also a complicated one. We've learned through our research that the sudden rise of remote working damaged some aspects of organizational life more than others. In June, when we held our first public webinar with Condeco in the series, we explored how companies were struggling to mentor, to train and to innovate during the crisis. Today, we're looking at another aspect of the fallout from COVID-19. More informal face-to-face -face activities such as unplanned collaboration, serendipitous encounters, and the social value of workplace experience. To discuss all this, we've got three experts with bags of expertise to share. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ross Drake, Head of IT Delivery and Support at Aston Martin's F1 team. He's speaking to us from Silverstone. Michael Pritzilla, Managing Director of Intelligent and Digital Workplaces uh, at Accenture. He's speaking to us from Mexico. And Mike Pilcher, Chief Sales Officer at Condeco. Welcome to you all. I'm going to start with Ross because Aston Martin, Formula One, it all sounds very glamorous, but, but you're very team oriented and there must have been some struggles during the pandemic. So what's your journey to uh, get out of the crisis and into the new workplace? What's your line of travel right now? Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, so our return back to the workplace and our journey um, has really been based around um, uh, getting back into the workplace as quickly as possible to enable us to uh, go racing again. Um, you know, we can't, uh, we can't build race cars, we can't build parts, um, we can't uh, do many things without people being back in the workplace. And so we we went through a phase of um, home working, which was pretty compulsory across the board, um, because uh, you know, with with the pandemic, you know, to start off with, people weren't allowed to leave home unless they absolutely had to, it was absolutely necessary to do so. Um, and you know, for Formula One was kind of put on hold for a period last year as well. And when we started coming back to the workplace um, around September last year. Uh, to enable that to happen, we, uh, we introduced a lot of social distancing within our factory. Uh, we uh, utilize a lot of our meeting rooms as additional office space. Um, and we also utilized um, hot desking uh, within our organization as well um, to, uh, to encourage some of our users uh, or some of our team to come back into the workplace and feel safe and, and, and secure that they're coming into a, a sanitized environment. In terms of getting people to come back, clearly there's an imperative for you to get your team back together. It's a very face-to-face -face business. Was safety the number one priority and hygiene? Safety and hygiene have been paramount through, throughout this period of time. Um, you know, we've, we introduced uh, daily testing in the factory for everyone uh, coming into the factory daily. Um, and we've continued that. Um, uh, you know, up to today as well. So we're still testing daily. Um, so yeah, the, the, that, the hygiene and, and the safety is absolutely paramount. And you know, to take our sport very seriously, 
um, we've we've had to do this in such a way that we're able to protect our race teams well. So turning to uh, Michael uh, Priscilla at Accenture, um, you've not just got your own workplace to worry about, you've also got what you're advising your clients on the future of work. What's been your, your story? What's the picture that you see it now? What are your clients telling you about their return to the office? Thanks, Jeremy. And again, uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to, uh, to, to tune in today. Um, you know, definitely along the lines of, of what Ross uh, has, has described they're going through at, uh, at Aston Martin there is um, on our clients' minds, number one is, is obviously safety of, of their people. Um, making sure people are safe, uh, but also that they feel safe. Um, you know, there's definitely um, a hesitance for people to rush back to the workplace, um, not only just in the workplace, but definitely in the more densely populated cities, the process of getting to the workplace, right? If you live in somewhere like New York or Chicago, um, LA, San Francisco, um, you know, commuting to the office can also be an exposure or risk factor that, that um, employees don't want to, to uh, expose themselves to, but um, that employers also don't want to have, uh, have their people um, sort of exposed to at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, outside of that, definitely what you mentioned earlier, Jeremy, is there is a, an increased um, groundswell of, of um, demand to come back for social aspects of work. Um, and organizations are really focused on how they can support that, um, how they can bring their teams back together to have those you know, important moments, those team building activities, um, help people to, to build their networks across the organization, which um, and as you mentioned earlier, those serendipitous moments are really hard to come by in, in a virtual world where we're scheduling everything in 30 or 15 minute blocks. Um, so people are definitely keen to come back and, and um, have those experiences again, um, less so on coming back to, to work in the traditional way that they were in the past. And so organizations are, are juggling right now, um, how do they enable that to happen? Um, how do they build, redesign um, both services electronically, digitally, um, and also the physical spaces to encourage people to feel safe to come back and uh, have those in-person in -person moments um, safely, uh, but also to, to continue to foster them uh, to be productive outside of the workplace. So um, we're definitely at a, at a junction now where organizations are, are trying to, to work out how to do both of those things, um, how to encourage people to come back, feel safe, uh, but also continue to support them um, in a remote working environment and ultimately um, allow them to make choices that make them feel safe as, uh, as individuals. I mean, we, we ran a piece last week on the WorkTech Academy platform about what was happening in the UK as regards inducing people to return. Companies were struggling to get people back to the city of London, for example, and they were offering free coffee, free food, table tennis, um, a DJ, cocktails. Everything was social, nothing was to do with work. Is this the same picture in the States where they're emphasizing the informal socializing of work as a way to pe bring people back? Yeah, Jeremy, I can't say that I've, I've, uh, I've seen that, that start to happen yet, but uh, it's definitely um, not, not far off what I think is going to, to take place. Um, definitely organizations are starting to think like, what is it going to take to induce our people to come back? What is it that's, what, how, can we make, um, how can we make the workplace special again, right? Um, there, there's definitely no shortage of um, agreement that uh, people aren't interested in coming back to a brown office full of high-walled cubes to sit in a desk and, and send email eight hours a day. Um, so there's definitely a lot of focus on how do we how do we pivot the, the use case for the office? How do we pivot what happens there? Um, and how do we make it an attractive place to return um, for those things that the organization knows that it's struggling um, to do in a remote fashion? And, and the reality is most of that is, is collaborative work, team building, um, and those community events that, uh, you know, we can only do so many happy hours on, uh, on Zoom or Teams. Um, before, uh, you know, we kind of uh, decide that the next one really isn't, isn't that important. I'm going to bring in uh, Mike Pilcher. Um, Mike, what are Condeco's clients telling you? What are their priorities for bringing people back? What we're seeing uh, 
is a, is a starting line, not a finishing line. And I, and I know that might sound a bit trite, but I actually think it's really critical because everybody, we and it's a starting line where some people are running a sprint and some people are running a marathon and everything in between. And what I'm seeing, and I'm seeing this not just through what I'm hearing with uh, uh, from our from our customers, but I'm also hearing it sort of anecdotally from my brother-in-law at the weekend who works for a large chemical company and somebody I was talking to works for a large investment bank. Um, I think we're seeing everybody move at different different paces. So uh, that's partly driven by um, uh, the the culture of the company. It's partly driven by what we what what I see across markets where uh, people start to get back in the office and then they go into lockdown and suddenly everything gets put on hold and there's a pause and then there's another consideration. Um, I think there's also something that. Uh, uh, as we've been talking about earlier about the sort of how do we encourage people people back in but there is a trend that i've seen over the last i'm going to say two to four weeks so it's this very nascent trend but i think the way you were describing you know they're encouraging people to come back in with ping pong and socials and the rest of it i'm seeing a number of organizations saying okay that's all very interesting but actually you're going to be coming back in four days a week um, and i just heard from somebody today um the policy was you either come back in five days a week or you don't come back in at all. Not not as in you have no job, but there will be no space for you. So there will be a permanent space or there won't be a space space for you. And now there's to, but I equally had heard that that was the initial response from the company as a large, large corporation. And then they were sort of easing off from that a little bit and saying, well, maybe maybe three or four days a week is fine. But I, but I'm starting to see uh, organizations that definitely two or three months ago were doing it sort of uh, encouraging and nudging and and cajoling, moving to more of a okay. Well, actually, the the data is saying if you're double jabbed, you're going to be fine. So actually, now it's no longer a, a, as, as much of a choice. You've got some flexibility, but there's more of a mandate coming through. Not, but I'm equally seeing others at the other extreme end who are saying no, no, you know, we're in no hurry to get people back in. So I think it's it's a it's a it's a multi-dimensional spectrum of different people at different phases based upon and also something um ross the thing you were talking about uh, about the type of business so one of the first businesses we saw going back in um and i'm not going to for, for a minute suggest that you're in the entertainment industry but it was people in the entertainment industry but it was when you were talking ultimately you want people to watch what you're doing. You want you want people to, to, to broadcast it on TV. And it was the, the first sort of people we heard going back in, in from our customer base were um, uh, people in the media industry, uh, writers who needed to, who just collaborated infinitely better on a show if they went back in the office. So again, I think we're also seeing a, dim a dimensionality of, of what, what industry are you in, what industry are you in, what country are you in, you might be in in the in the um, uh, in the entertainment industry, but if you're in Singapore right now, you you're not going back in. So I, I think it's actually hard to look at trends at the moment because you've got so many different dynamics about about what industry, what location. Are you in a lockdown? Are you not in a lockdown? I was talking to somebody in Australia today. Um, locked down again. They were just they were just in the process of getting back in, and now they're locked down for an indeterminate period of time. I think this is a good moment to bring in our first poll. We've got a series of polls um, so that we can gauge the temperature amongst our, our webinar participants. So hopefully coming up on your screen, our first poll. And the question is, what is the biggest barrier facing your organization in returning to the office? Is it convincing the employees it's safe to return? Um, is it redesigning the workplace to support a work anywhere model? Uh, is it providing the right technology for a flexible future? Or is it deciding what model to adopt in the first place? So you've got a choice of four, we could have added more, but pick one of those, uh, make your vote now, and hopefully in a minute or two, I will get the results and we can discuss them. Um, I want to, uh, uh, while we're waiting for the results, um, I just wanna come back to Ross and um, ask you about um, this idea of unplanned um, uh, collaboration and experience, social experience, what's been happening in the stairwells and the coffee points and the restaurants at Aston Martin 
since you've come back. Have you noticed um, a, a step change in your ability to collaborate or innovate? Um, is there a social layer to, 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 to what you do? You're very directed, obviously, but, but what part does informal collaboration play? So if I have a look at the way that we have returned back to the workplace, um, it, uh, coming to your example of uh, what's it like in a stairwell, what's it like next to a coffee machine, um, everyone's been very respectful of, uh, of maintaining social distancing and, and, and great hygiene. Um, but the introduction of some of the some new technologies that we've been using um, has allowed for, um, I guess, more pop-up meetings, um, better use of uh, meeting spaces being uh, technology driven as opposed to physically driven. Um, so, you know, people meeting a stairwell, people meeting by a coffee machine have been very short and sweet interactions. That's, that's very, very interesting. We've got the results in. The top um, place, 42% uh, of you, nearly half of you said, the biggest barrier was deciding what new model to adopt in the first place. That's 42%. Closely followed, um, but not that close, uh, redesigning the workplace to support a work anywhere model. That's 27%. And lagging behind is, is well, 18% providing the right technology and just 12% convincing employees it's safe to return to the office. You may have thought that safety would be the biggest barrier, but companies probably have worked out how to do that. The model is harder. Michael, what do you make of that result? To be honest, it's, it's not, not terribly surprising to me. The second and the third uh, options there are definitely you know, activities that we see trailing, making the decision about what to do. Um, you know, I, I was listening to Mike earlier, you know, talk about organizations that have looked at or have started to put in place various different models of you must be in four days a week, you must be in three days a week. Um, there's three days a week that, that your group is going to, to tell you what they are and the other two you can choose or um, you, you must come in at least 60% of the time, but you get to choose what 60% they are. There's so many different models that, that we've seen. Um, that, that organizations are toying with, like, what is the best one? And because no one has really done it, um, there isn't any data to suggest what the impacts of choosing one versus the other is. And so um, I definitely concur with, with the data that you're seeing on, that, uh, on the survey in that there's definitely a lot of analysis paralysis going on. Um, I think that one of the challenges that organizations are, are facing, and you know, we've had this from, from direct discussions with um, executive leadership teams is that the organization from a management and leadership perspective would like everyone to come back, but they also know that they can't come out and say that they can't come out and force people to come back um, because it's going to you know, cause attrition issues. It's going to cause, uh, you know, impact people's morale within the organization. And so trying to find that right balance is where a lot of organizations are stuck right now. Um, and then, you know, deciding on once, once that model has been, you know, decided on, they move forward with it. The next part is, you know, redesigning the space and then making sure the technology is there to support whatever that model is. So um, the numbers that we've got back in the survey there don't surprise me yet at all. If you were to answer it yourself on behalf of Accenture, what do you think Accenture's biggest barrier is? We're in a very fortunate position um, as an organization, given that we've always been a workforce that um, the, the majority majority of people work remotely. We work from home, we work from our clients' uh, facilities. Um, and so we're very fortunate in that this event hasn't caused us to have to really rethink the technology or the way that our spaces are configured. Um, we already have an agile working environment. We already have uh, our offices that are designed um, around being collaboration hubs and places where our teams come together to work versus um, come to do individual work. Um, so, you know, we're really just going through the process right now of, of the safety aspect of it. What do we do when people choose to come in? Um, many of our offices in, in uh, parts of the world that are allowed to have um, people come back um, are now open um, for our our employees to to use. Um, you know, there's testing procedures in place and pro uh, protocols that we have to follow before we go in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they are um, becoming available um, as uh, as deemed required by the by the local local regions and the laws for us to uh, have people start to come in and get together again. There's going to be more polls and and. Um... 
everybody watching this, you can ask questions of our panel, use the Q&A, and all of these will come through to me to filter. Well, thank you for your um, uh, insights on the first poll. We're gonna go to the second poll now, and this is hopefully coming up on your screen, is how does your organization intend to address workplace experience? Um, there are three options here. One is we're committed to making changes, but still reviewing the option. It's the watch and wait uh, option. Um, uh, or we, we've already got a new work experience strategy in place, ready to go. Uh, or we'll continue to do the way the things we've always done them. Um, and remember that Michael uh, did say that, that, that in his network, um, the Accenture network, companies were saying we're not going back to the old boring baseline office. So if you could vote now on, um, uh, on uh, um, this question around how you intend to address workplace experience. Uh, this idea of, um, uh, and we'll have the results in a minute, um, this idea of uh, um, informal experience being, although it's not directly part of uh, workflow, if you like, but actually influencing productivity and satisfaction in the workplace. Mike Pilcher, is this something that surprised you uh, as it's come out of the research um, with Gundeka? The research, I think, as I said earlier, is a real challenge because um, uh, one of the things we, we've been looking at doing is getting um, uh, empirical data from our customers. And the challenge is they're all doing things at different, <laughs> different paces. So when I look at any of the data sets, I always have to look, look at, I was talking to our board recently about this and they were sort of drilling in. I said, well, yeah, but we're only a small subset of that overall data set anyway. Our historical customers are largely geared to professional services, financial services. So I think there's a, for me, there's a real challenge at the moment with all of the data. And, and I, I was listening to what you were saying, Michael, the organization's trying to uh, figure out what they were, um, yeah, they don't want to be too prescriptive, but they don't want to be non-prescriptive, but equally I'm seeing some being very prescriptive and some not being prescriptive. My sort of declared position on all data right now <laughs> is it's a bit murky because 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 you're you're always talking to a small subset, and it, clearly our, our polls at the moment are, you know, uh, of the, the few hundred people who are on this call. Oh, the results, it, the results of the poll actually. Well, so it, it's, sorry, just to fin finish on that, I, is, is I just think it's it's really hard because we're, to, what, to Michael's point, we're trying to predict the future based upon no historical precedent. I, I would, we'd have to go back to Spanish flu, and I don't think that'd be very, <laughs> that'd certainly be very helpful. So, so, so at the moment, I'm, I, I'm, I think using data to predict the future at the moment is really quite is really quite tricky. Well, uh, our informal straw poll of our webinar participants uh, won't surprise you that 63 percent, nearly two thirds of our poll say we're still we're committed to making changes, but still reviewing the options. Only 11 percent said they do things the way they'd always do it. And a quarter of the sample have got a new workplace strategy in place ready to go we're going to feel and see uh, some very different organizations and very different organizational experiences. Uh, Ross, what do you make of that? Um, and where would Aston Martin fit into those three options? Well, actually, I was going to just, um, just slip in a quick question um, to all, really, which, um, which comes back to, um, at the moment, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at um, how people are returning to work, but how does this work in favor of people that are looking to change position and join new organizations? Is this now changing the way that uh, organizations need to prepare themselves to advertise themselves even more as an organization that you want to come and work for because of those the, the conditions you can come, you're gonna be joining and you'll be working as part of? Mm. Well, that, that is a very interesting question. Perhaps Michael. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've got to, yeah, Ross, I, I totally agree, right? And I think that this links back to, you know, my comment earlier about organizations struggling with the model. Um, you know, I, while right now safety is definitely the primary concern of, of, uh, of all organizations, longer term um, talent attraction and retention is their number one concern, right? Is that if we put in place policies that our people don't like um, and the talent that we're either currently have that we want to retain or that we're looking to attract, 
um, isn't, let's call it market competitive with the types of people that we want, are we going to be able to get those skills? Definitely, you know, in the digital space, um, you know, you, you, there's, there's a race for digital talent, not just within the tech firms, but within um, all, all types of firms. Um, and so if you're a pharma company or you're a consumer packaged goods company or you're a retailer and you're looking to get, you know, mobile app developers or people that are great at data analytics, um, they could easily go and work for a tech firm that allows them to work from, you know, the country farmhouse um, that, that has internet connection versus having to move to a big industrial city. Um, and so they're definitely looking at weighing up what that means. What does their choices now mean to retaining the people that they want to retain um, and being able to be an organization that can competitively recruit um, the types of skills that they want into the future? I think if I could uh, just uh, comment, Ross, and I'll only comment in a, in a tweet or a soundbite, um, but if I was to say what were the, the things I just keep hearing from customers is attract and retaining talent is the thing that just keeps coming up. Jeremy and I, you, you and I have talked about this before, the sort of the Goldmans of everyone's coming back in five days a week, mandated, end of story. Uh, you hear that from customers all the time as cited as we're not going to do that because we want to attract and retain the best people. That yeah. just comes up again and again. I mean, the Goldman solution this week was to offer all new recruits a 30% pay rise, uh, <laughs> providing they commit to coming into the office five days a week. I mean, Goldman Sachs are an example of a type of organization I would call resolute returners. They want everybody back, you know, and, and some people um, say that's regressive. They say that they're, they're bringing people back for progressive reasons, for the kinds of things we're talking about to learn to innovate in formal collaboration, social experience. Um, but what's interesting is that for companies, I think they've got a choice to make between how coercive they are and how collegiate they are. And I know that Michael in the States, that a lot of um, certainly Accenture clients, big corporates are saying you've got to be vaccinated to come on campus. Um, and they're kind of fudging it more in group. Um, let's move on to our third poll, um, and this is how does your organization intend to address informal collaboration? Um, and you've got three choices here. We want everyone back in the office to promote serendipity. Uh, we're taking a digital first approach to managing collaboration. We're struggling with how to rebuild social connections at work. So three, three options. Um, uh, three options there that, that we'd love to hear from you. Um, I, I'm, I'm very interested, uh, Ross, in, in how much collaboration is formal and planned at Aston Martin um, and how much of it is informal and ad hoc. And do you leave spaces in your schedule for more random encounters or, is, or are you really got it all nailed down? I think um, the pandemic has taught us quite a lot um, where uh, you, you, some organisations um, have this uh, mentality of have a meeting for meeting's sake and perhaps another meeting to catch up with those meeting action points because no one's covered them off. Uh, we've certainly moved into a, 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 a smarter way of working using collaboration tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and you walk around the factory and that's pretty much what everyone's doing all day long. Everyone's collaborating constantly. And rather than having breaks and going off to meeting rooms, um, you know, people really are truly engaging in calls all day long. And, and that continuous collaboration, I think, you know, just makes teams work so much better. Um, and don't get me wrong, it, it's, it's lovely to, to stay just in front of a computer, but it's, I think it's been very, very rewarding uh, for us all as a team to be able to see each other back in the factory as well. Uh, that, that's very, very interesting. Um, we've got the result of this. It's a kind of almost a tie between we're struggling with how to rebuild social connections at work, which is the theme here of watch and wait. Um, still reviewing, still revising, still thinking about it. Um, but also we're taking a digital first approach to managing collaboration. So we've really stepped away from, from using the office building as a container for ad hoc, just presenteeism and pulling people together. We're into a kind of digital uh, uh, first approach. Michael, turning to um, the technologies involved, and you're all very, very skilled in this, but I'll start with Michael. 
what 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 is this result saying what type of technologies are we going to see to managing informal collaboration we kind of know about resource management and room booking systems and workplace apps but how is the how is the serendipitous encounter the social engagement aspect how's that going to be managed digitally yeah i think that you know for me there's there's a there's a difference between um the digital first collaboration and and the social aspect of it right I, I definitely would agree that the vast majority of organizations are moving towards you know digital tools as the primary collaboration platform um, mainly because it allows choice of of the participants right we can all collaborate um on a on a level playing field when digital tools are being used whether i'm at home or whether i'm in the office you know we're looking to provide this um, you know, we've been using the term uh, remote employees as, as first class citizens in, in all sort of meetings and collaborative uh, encounters. So digital tools is the enabler to, to make that happen. Um, you know, I think that how lucky we are that, that, you know, this has happened at the time that it has with tools where they are now, because uh, had, had we gone through this in the last 18 months, um, even five or six years ago, uh, many of the co-creation tools and the collaboration tools that are exist now were not at the, the, the capability that they are today. Uh, and we would probably be having a very different discussion. So uh, I'm not surprised by, by um, you know, what the, the poll has come back with, and it's definitely what we're seeing most of our organizations and, and, uh, and our, our clients um, pivoting towards. Um, on the topic of, you know, the serendipitous encounter, um, you know, for me, this really comes back to, to the social aspect of it, right? Um, when are people going to be in the office? Um, do, when do I know that my colleagues or uh, people that are, are close in my network are going to be there? And maybe that's the prompter for me to be able to, to go into the office um, on that day as well. Um, maybe not necessarily to meet with them, but just to be able to go and have lunch with them, right? Um, so we're definitely seeing what I'm what I'm expecting to see more and more of is that people will be choosing to go to the office either for a specific type of collaborative session, which they feel is going to um, be better in person, be it a formal one or an informal, you know, drink session or a ping pong match or whatever it might happen to be, um, or simply knowing that a close colleague of theirs is going to be there for a similar reason. And they're like, well, hey, you know, Ross is going to be there tomorrow. Um, you know what, I'm going to go in as well, because maybe we can catch up and have lunch. And I, I see those two scenarios being the key drivers for uh, for people to come back. It's very, very uh appetite that you talk about um, the uh, remote worker as a first class citizen, because before the pandemic, if you were joining a meeting remotely, you were most definitely a third class citizen. You were that guy marooned on a laptop um, while everybody else was eating chocolate biscuits in the room. Now there's a lot of solutions coming through about digital equality and making sure that 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 everyone has the same experience, whether they're physically present or not. Yeah. Mike, can you give us an insight from a Condeco perspective on what's coming down the pipe in terms of the technologies that you're looking at and that you're exploring? I mean, you've done a lot of work around the meeting experience and we know it's going to change. We know the glass box is uh, stuffy and dated. And where are you going with the technology of meetings? Long term, the strategy is around it, it is where you'd expect so AI and ML, machine learning, right? So the, all of that data we can get, um, and to to make the interaction between the physical and the digital just much more seamless. So uh, I can see that Ross is in the office every Wednesday. I can see that you haven't collaborated with him in three months. You make a recommendation that maybe I shift my day in the office from Tuesday Tuesday to the day that, that Ross is in there. So that that's that's just a really simple example of the sort of thing you can do when you start to sort of drill into drill into the data. I think in the medium term, um, uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of client demand, um, but also a lot of direction from ourselves of integration with these tools. So tight integration with teams in particular that, that I would have to say consistently we hear teams from customers now we are Condeco is built on the Microsoft platform to go back to your the early point about the data so I've been unable to know if that is because typically our clients are going to be more likely to be Microsoft centric 
I don't hear as much Zoom as I do as I do here Teams, but really tight integration with that as well, so that we can bring people who are scheduling their time remotely and scheduling their time in the office, and whether they're then choosing to be on Teams or be in the office to make that really simple, to make it easy to find a Teams room. If you're redesigning, there's some really fascinating stuff that I think both Microsoft and Gartner are doing around redesign of meeting rooms. And I, I certainly feel that when I'm uh, on a on a uh, on a digital end of it, and I'm in a meeting room that's traditionally designed with people on a long desk, that it doesn't it doesn't feel quite right. And there's a lot of uh, work that Gartner and Microsoft are talking about about making it more auditorium like. So being able to find those rooms and make sure you book them in if you're going to be doing a sort of a mixed collaboration in person and remote. So there's the, there's this sort of stuff we've been doing historically that how do you digitize the physical and the and the and the uh, uh, the physical and the virtual, and then longer term, what can we do around AI? What can we do to make it easier to use the spaces, easier to collaborate with people? Understanding how often I've worked with Ross how how, how long it's been since I had time with Michael, how you can pull teams together when you can see that they're congregating in the office on a particular particular uh, particular event. So that's definitely the longer term stuff. But, but uh, at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges we've got is to use, to, to drive that ML and, and AI, we need the data. And at the moment, people aren't fully back in the office right now. So we're, we're sort of getting that data together and getting it aggregated. But uh, that's definitely a sort of a, six to six to 18 month plan. That's very interesting what you say about data, Mike, um, because people are now talking about companies basing their strategy around data and buildings and collaboration patterns are spewing out data. Um, very relevant to Aston Martin, it's known as digital exhaust. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I want to ask, <laughs> Ross, um, are you using, how are you using data around work at Aston Martin. Are, are you collecting it? Are you analyzing it? Are you acting on it? Uh, we're not, no, sorry, that sounds a bit boring, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but no, we're not, we're not, we're not collecting or, or analyzing any data around, um, around, around our uh, collaborations and, and, and experiences. But one thing that we are beginning uh, to do, um, as you may have just seen in the in the media, uh, we're building a new uh, new factory, new campus. Um, we've just broken ground on it, uh, just next to where we are here in Silverstone, and so we're looking at um, how the workplace will change mm -hmm. in that new factory. So we've been going through um, quite a quite a number of scenarios of how people would meet in those uh, in in the new factory, and also looking at how not just data, but how we can utilize new technologies um, in the best way possible as well. So you know, we're, we're leading forward with, um, with uh, I guess, the statement of introducing a smart factory. I think we're the first, well, sorry, the last, the last uh, Formula One team to build a factory in the UK was around 11 years ago, it was McLaren. Uh, so we're the first team to, to have done so since then. And technology has moved along a long way since then. So we've got um, a very, very, unique opportunity now to start from the ground up literally and i suppose that's a hybrid uh, mix of factory space workspace collaboration space yeah it certainly is uh, i think that will be really fantastic to to look out for and analyze um, i'm going to go on to our final poll because we're racing through our webinar um, uh, our final poll is about how will your organization apply technology to workplace experience and collaboration. And um, there are three options. Uh, we've already implemented a new approach with new technology, so we're already on the journey. Um, we are planning to invest in this area in the near future, um, or we've yet to be convinced of the business case. So this is technology in relation to workplace experience and informal collaboration, the kinds of things we've been talking about, um, higher value social interaction and experience. Uh, technology to support that. So if you could all vote. Um, I'll come to Michael and um, if you could if you could kind of paint a picture of, of, of what you think is going to happen over the next few months. We, we've agreed that the picture is a little bit murky, um, but the, the broader scenarios for the future of work, the, the broader kind of um, guardrails, if you like, of where we're heading, uh, seem to be in place, and, and they are an acceleration in some senses uh, of what went on before the 
pandemic uh, rather than a disruption. Um, what's your, within Accenture, what's your time horizon for, for things not settling down, but becoming clearer? You're asking me to look into the uh, crystal ball there, um, and it seems to be changing on a, on a month by month and a, and a week by week. <laughs> <laughs> on a month by month and a week by week basis. No, but I definitely think that, you know, some of the things that we're, we're seeing kind of settle in universally across the board is that, you know, technology is going to play a much bigger part in the way that people work than it used to. Um, that there is a requirement to invest more heavily in the technology and physical space than some organizations have invested before. Um, you know, I've, I've held a belief for, for many years now that, um, you know, the meeting room in organizations has been fundamentally broken for many, many years, um, and that we had come to a point as consumers of, of meeting room space that they are just broken and they don't work, right? It wasn't uncommon or unexpected to walk into a room in 2019 and find that the audio was bad or that the phone line wasn't connected or that the, you know, the video conferencing unit wasn't working properly, right? And we just kind of got on with it and called the two people that we're going to call in remotely and say, sorry, it's not working. I'm going to call you on your mobile phone, right? And you can kind of just listen in. Um, that type of thing's not going to fly in the future. It's not going to be accepted by, by the workforce. And, you know, there's going to be um, demands on IT to operate meeting spaces or these collaborative spaces as mission critical services, the same way that they have been operating data centers, for, for example. Um, so I think that's gonna be the number one thing that people are focusing on is how do we get our technologies in the spaces um, up and running and, and making sure that they're always available. It's gonna play key into um, experience of people. It's going to play you know, a key role in making them want to come back the second time. Um, you know, I'm a strong believer that we've probably got two chances of wowing people when they come into the office again for the first time. They're going to come in. If the experience isn't good, they're maybe going to come in one more time. And if we haven't nailed it by then, they're just going to not come back, right? They're going to say, every time I go in, the experience isn't great. I'm not as productive as I'm able to be at home. I'm just not going to go in. Um, so I think that right now, organizations are focusing on getting that experience right, getting that service level right, and getting the, the, um, the, the equipment, the digital tools um, into those spaces to support um, the activities that they're either going to um, entice, enforce, or encourage people to come back into the office um, to, to consume, to, uh, to getting them right. That's a very good note on which to... Um bring this webinar. Uh, sadly, our time is, is running out. I'll just give you the results uh, of our final poll. And it's in line with how you, our webinar participants, have been feeling throughout this webinar. 47%, um, nearly half of you, say we've already implemented uh, a new approach with new technology, which is more than strategy. Uh, so you're already there with new technology, which is pretty encouraging. I think in a digital first world. I'm not surprised at that. Um, but 37% are planning to invest this, in this area in the near future, and only 16% have yet to be convinced. Uh, Mike Pilcher, uh, encouraging results from your perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, I, I'm as aligned with Michael as uh, I usually am. I, I have a feeling we're going to see um, uh, businesses uh, encourage. I think encouraging forcefully, but <laughs> might be something we're seeing. We're seeing in future. I think the economic impact of of us not getting back into the into the workplace over the next. If we look at it as a two to five year window, I, I think. While I think it's um, uh, as we as we're saying with Ross about uh, attracting, retaining the best best talent. Although I think that's going to be critical. I think there's but there's a big key thing we haven't spoken about. Maybe this is a uh, front and center for me because of because uh, of the age of uh, some of my kids. Um, is there, there's a whole demographic that is very keen to get back in the office as well. Um, and I and so I think there's a, there's going to be a push from those earlier in their career. Maybe a pull from people later in their career, and then there's also going to be a, the dynamic of the of the business as well, saying, "Okay, well, actually, we're running a business here, and we need to, we need some structure around it." 
So, so uh, while I agree with what you were saying, Michael, about um, uh, potentially, you know, come in once, come in twice, but I think the third time that might be because they were told <laughs> told to come in <laughs> rather than they didn't come in at all. I think it's something that I hadn't considered: the coercion versus the collegiate uh, yeah. approach. This is going to divide companies. I'm going to end with where I started with Ross. Um, Aston Martin, a, um, coercive control or collegiate approach to the new office? Um, I'd say it's a combination of both. But one thing you've got to remember with, with Formula One um, is the call factor, right? Yeah, we, we love what we do. And there's no, there's no way you're going to have me working from home if I don't need to be. Yeah. And that's very much the mentality across the organization. People want to be here yeah. they love what they do. Yeah. They love what our, our organization stands for and our sport as well. If yeah, to be fair, I'd like to be, be yeah. <laughs> joining the office too. So. Um, yes, it's never too old to be a racing driver, in my view, um, uh, or even, or even uh, a, ra a racing car designer. Um, the, the, it's been a really interesting conversation. You've brought up some, some terrific uh, points and you have uh, um, really got to grips with the slightly intangible nature of more informal uh, um, interpersonal social interaction and experience and collaboration, often not accounted for, but we, I feel that we have uh, nailed some vectors of this. Um, don't forget, everybody, there is a special Condeco report produced in collaboration with WorkTech Academy. It's called Enhancing Experience and Collaboration, Routes to Revival and Returning to the Office. And all WorkTech um, and Condeco webinar participants will be sent a copy. Um, it remains for me to thank um, Condeco um, for this collaboration and particularly uh, to thank our three uh, insightful speakers, Ross Drake of Aston Martin's F1 team, uh, Michael Britula uh, of Accenture, and Mike Pilcher of Kindeco. Um, thank you all for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.